All right, welcome to June 2022's Continuing Education, Excited Delirium. So Excited Delirium is a very important topic. It's a very dangerous topic. It's one in which I think every single one of us has encountered on the ambulance, on the fire um, apparatus, in the hospital. The, it's, it's becoming ever more present. If you ask someone 50 years ago what's Excited Delirium, they'd look at you like you're crazy yourself. But now it's become such a hot topic word in our pre-hospital setting with the resurgence of you know higher power drugs our psychotic patients mental illness things like that so how are we going to tackle this so let's talk about the objectives real quick um, we need to find what it is how to identify what is going on with excited delirium what are the risks in the pre-hospital setting for excited delirium and how do we treat it so Starting off with definitions, it's extreme agitation and aggression in a patient with altered mental status. We know this, we've seen it, and it's not just about drugs, it's about a whole bunch of stuff. And we'll talk about that in the pathophysiology, um, but one in 10 cases end in cardiac arrest. Now this is something that when I was going through in preparation for this lecture, I didn't really know that. I mean, I, I can, I've had more than 10 excited deliriums and none of them have died, but it can happen, um, especially if it's true excited delirium, and if you don't get them under control, um, you know there there are plenty of stories. We all have our, our stories in our toolbox about you know the excited delirium patient that was running around the uh, the road naked or in the house naked or the belligerent um, you know overdose that was just out of his mind, and we had to take you know five ten people to to do them. So it's, it's definitely a dangerous situation, a um, high intensity, high adrenaline situation, and they can die. And I mean, usually when they do die, it's the calm before the storm, and the storm is the cardiac arrest. And we'll talk about them a little bit here too. Um, but more importantly, they do pose a very significant risk, not only to themselves, you, your partner, law enforcement, allied health professional, and anyone else that's around them. It's like a tornado ripping through a town. So we really need to not only prepare for that situation by having all the resources available, and we'll talk about the formal NAEMSP position statement, but also how you're going to protect other people from around them. So without further ado, let's see our first video for the day. There he is right there. Hey, get on the ground! Hey, get on the ground! All right, so lots of stuff, and then he stops breathing and he dies. Um, very, very dangerous situation there. Obviously, we saw in this video, um, you know, a male patient walking around in a neighborhood that looks just like any of our neighborhoods. And he's obviously not himself. He's naked. Um, he obviously you hear people yelling in the background, you know, his name. They know him. He's part of this neighborhood. We don't know what's going on. And it's not always drugs. It's other things, too. I mean, maybe it's electrolytes or alba balance, you know, low sodium, high potassium can cause these types of things. Maybe he was he's sick, maybe septic, maybe he had a stroke. Who knows? It's not all about drugs. And so we really need to be aware that we have to be medical providers and do our H's and T's 
um, like just what we do with our cardiac arrest, and we'll talk about some of the things that it could be that it needs to go through your mind that, man, you know, is he high or is it something much more insidious like a medical problem? So knowing these things and making sure that we as medical providers alert the police department that things could go awry. Now, obviously, you didn't see an ambulance anywhere in this video. And unfortunately, with the very serious, you know, out of control patients that are out of control from the beginning, the police department is the first people on scene. And BSI, you know, scene safe, we're not there, they are. And so they have to undergo some extensive training. Now, you've all heard the stories about these individuals where they get sprayed with mace, they get beat with a, with a nightstick, where they get tased multiple times. It's like, you know, I don't know, Captain Planet throwing uh, powers on them and they're just shocking them. I mean, there's like five or six people in a ring around them just loading them up with 10,000 volts, but they're still going. They have a very high threshold for pain and it's almost like they're just this, you know, zombie, brutal berserker that can do whatever they want to do and there's no repercussions. There's nothing that you can do. Well, there is something that we can do that police can't do and that is sedation and that's going to be um, one of the major things is that once you get these patients properly restrained or at least in an area where you can pop them with some ketamine you will save the day now does that mean that they're not going to go into arrest no but what that does mean is that you can put them in a position where in case they do you can bring them into a suitable situation to have the maximal positive medical effect so let's move on to the methods identifying excited delirium. So we've already seen this violent behavior, increased pain tolerance, a superhuman strength. These, these people can lift bodies off of them. And usually the reason why they're going through excited delirium is it's multifactorial. It can be a whole bunch of things. It can be a bad combo of drugs. It can be a bad combo of electrolytes. It can be a stroke. It can be anything. And if it triggers them in just the right way that it creates this storm in their, um, their body chemistry, then it will send them into the red zone. So there are several medical conditions that can precipitate this. Low oxygen levels. We've seen people get a little, little altered whenever their blood oxygen levels decrease. Head injuries are patients that have a traumatic brain injury from a motor vehicle incident, a assault that involves their head, or even hypoglycemia. Our hypoglycemic patients, when they get low, you know, they feel, they feel off. And most of these patients will say, well, I just feel tired. I don't really have a lot of energy. But it can go the completely opposite way. Their body goes into a fight or flight mode with that altered mental status, and the, the great machine called the body goes into this crazed state and there are patients that do that and it may mimic excited delirium with their violence their aggression and sometimes even their strength so going on um beyond that inflex infections or inflammation there are systemic inflammatory response servers um, that can cause especially if they're um, meningitic and they have a bacterial infection or infection of their brain that's going to make them confused and just because they have an infection in their brain doesn't mean that their heart, lungs, kidneys, and all the other things aren't working. And that means that we have all of our strength, but now we can override the governor limits that are imposed upon us by, you know, just general human being and culture. Epilepsy, people who are postictal, they can become very violent, as we've seen. Anticholinergic overdose. So our anticholinergics, you know, those, those individuals can become altered. And that goes with the blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, red as a beet, dry as a bone. You know, those types of things, those individuals that are exposed to agents can be sent into the red zone as well. Um, NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. These patients are the ones that are on our atypical antipsychotics and our other medications that we see so freely flowed out in our general population for you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, our mixed psychiatric, psychiatric problems, those individuals are going to be on these medications. And too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and they can be sent into these syndromes. 
Serotonin syndrome. Very difficult to differentiate between neural epileptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. Serotonin has clonus, but it has everything else that neuroleptic has. But that's really not the point of that. It's just that you can have someone who's on a large amount of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, Paxil, and then you may have them on duloxetine or venlafaxine or SNRIs. You can have them on Wilbutrin or uh, Buspirone. These, these medications that are meant to help people bring them up from depression may actually precipitate and send them into this hypervigilant state that will mimic or even cause them to have excited delirium. And then finally, thyroid storm. You know, the thyroid hormone is a very important hormone. It controls our cellular machination. It's the metabolic governor for all of what goes on in our body at the cellular level. And thyroid storm is an overproduction or a knee-jerk reaction by the body to overcreate. So this, by definition, can cause the body to ramp up and just imagine overclocking your body and the brain and all the organs. And these patients will be in a very dangerous environment generated by their pathophysiology that if we do not correct that by you know beta blockers and you know metaminazole and or propylthiouracil, things in the hospital that we do to fix this stuff in fluids, then we send these patients into a death spiral and they will die. And as we can see on here, every single one of these things, except for maybe hyperglycemia, um, and you know, not all head trauma is deadly, but every single one of these things has the capacity to kill a patient. We all know four minutes of no oxygen is brain death. 25% um, of the brain is lost every minute after four minutes. With our head trauma serious enough, you know, the person may never be the same. Hyperglycemia kills patients. Hyperglycemia in a type one diabetic is very dangerous with our DKAs. Infections, meningitis, our sepsis patients, you know as well as I do that sepsis kills patients. We referred to that at our previous continuing education. Epilepsy, status epilepticus, all the lactate buildup, all that uh, movement and just cell death because of um, our hyperperfusion, our overdoses, and then our thyroid storm, as I mentioned before, very, very, very dangerous. So keep in mind, none of this had anything to do with drugs. So remember, we can have excited delirium with our medical conditions and that is up to us as excellent providers to make sure that we are able to quickly identify and assess the things that we can assess. Now, granted, how do we check for hypoxia? Monitor. Head trauma? Context. Hypoglycemia? We have a glucometer. Infection? Well, we can get a temperature and we can just kind of wing it. Epilepsy? History or m observed movements? And then all this other stuff on the right, you know, do they have a history of um, thyroid problems. So they have a history of depression or schizophrenia or bipolar that they're on medications for if you can have access to that, which most of the time, if these patients are in the middle of the street naked, I'm pretty sure their medication bag isn't hanging on them like a fanny pack. So you're not going to know. So it's going to be difficult. And that therein lies the challenge about how do I fix this if I don't really know what's going on. So who gets this? Well, about 40 years old is when the first presentation of psychosis or altered mental status happens on average. Now, you know as well as I do, you can have a preteen demonstrating excited delirium, and it's not just about age, but on average, about 40 years or older, disorientation, altered mental status, you can have altered mental, uh, vital signs, hypertension or hypotension, you can have uh, tachycardia, most likely, not Brady, um, hypo or hyperglycemia, you're going to have um, possibly hypocapnia because they're breathing so fast. Um, if they're breath holding, hypercapnia, especially when they calm down into that death spiral. And then we have our um, our visual tactile or olfactory hallucinations that they complain of, that they'll tell you it's pretty, pretty sudden. Um, and patients that are around people that have observed them doing this will will say that, hey man, you know, he was He's kind of acted weird. He wasn't himself. And then, bam, it's just like a, a switch flipped. And so sometimes as they get closer to that state of excited delirium, they'll have a fluctuating consciousness as well. Now, I want you to put a bookmark in your head about that fluctuating consciousness, because we're going to talk about that a little critically in just a little bit about why that means so much, especially in the setting of 
Well, we got them down and now they're calm. Are they going to die? Is, is, did, is the ketamine working? What's going on? And so just think about that for a moment and keep that in your mind while we move on. So how does it happen? So psychiatric illness and acute drug use are the primary causes. Okay, now we've talked about other causes, but these are the two main triggers. And I started with the less likely first because I didn't want to give us a bias and say, oh, well, it's because they're insane or they have some severe psychiatric illness or they're just overdosing on drugs. Well, let's talk about the drugs real quick. Meth, Coke, PCP, LSD, bath salts, synthetic. Uh, you know, you can go over to the smoke shop in, in across from Shreve City and you can get synthetics. You can get synthetic cannabis. So it's, it's not illegal and they changed the formulation. So it's very easy to get that. And we all have heard stories anecdotally, or we've seen patients that have, that's all they do is smoke synthetic weed, and now they are a different person. They've lost who they were before, and uh, it sent them into a rage. Now, psychiatric illnesses, on the other hand, you know, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which means that they're adding something to themselves versus the negative, which means I'm removing something from myself. So a schizophrenic that has negative symptoms is an individual that doesn't really have that flat affect. They, they're really withdrawn. They don't really talk. They're kind of what they call catatonic. Whereas a positive schizophrenic is someone who we think more of a schizophrenic patient where they're, you know, talking in unknown words they're making words that's called neologisms they're just getting wild and they they they're paranoid they're out of their more out of the world bipolar disorder um, this is mainly affecting the bipolar mania and so these are the individuals that will talk a mile a minute they're just going wild you know buying things and they haven't slept in six days and they're just they're just going wild and then when they start to get in that manic phase some uh, delusions that's when they start to really get into the spot where we're talking about where they feel like they're threatened or they're threatening somebody or anything like that now personality disorder is a little different you know obviously with um, certain personality disorders these are inherent these are not dis um they're not syndromes so to speak like bipolar disorder is something that you know can maybe one day the patient will be normal personality disorder is very difficult to treat um, and there's a plethora of them. So, you know, personality disorders is kind of lower on the list here. Acute psychosis, absolutely. Um, new onset schizophrenia, a psychotic break, things like that. And then anytime they have an abrupt cessation of their antipsychotic medications, especially those who are very, very seriously medicated for their well-known psychiatric problems. So with that being said, I want you to um, just take a little moment and think about why do we give our psychotic patients who have been hospitalized, you've made runs in them, you take them to the hospital, and they have like a depo, a DEPOT, um, just like a meth, um, depo provera, like with females that get birth control in, um, in the injections. This is the same thing. We give depots of Abilify, we give depots of Seroquel, um, we give depots of Invega. And so we do this so that we can avoid this. Because a lot can be solved by patients getting long-term acting medications that will give them over a long period of time so that if they do miss a visit, we're, we're still kind of okay. We can get them back into the clinic and they're not just going to go you know, off the wall. And obviously we know that people who suffer from psychiatric illness may not be as apt to taking their normal regular medications. And so this in lies the problem that you can be the best provider you want and say, okay, we'll take this medication, it'll help you feel better. And they don't like how it makes them feel, so they stop and then they go into the, the spiral again. So how does it happen? Well, there's a couple things, all right? First off is excessive dopamine signaling in the central nervous system. And that is controlling the brain's regulatory ability for temperature control and maintaining normal temperature. So in addition to that, we also have that increase of our oxygen species that that's a O neg, not an O2, which means that it's very reactive and it can result in catastrophic tissue damage if left unchecked. So now we have two big problems. 
you're hot, and you have an overabundance of this reactive oxygen that's going in and tearing up your tissues. And I'm not talking about it's just tearing up your arms and legs because like that gentleman in that previous video trying to crawl through a wooden fence. Instead, we're talking about whole body destruction, brain, heart, kidneys, lungs, stomach, nerves, skin, everything. Everything is going to a point and the more we let it go on, the more we have acidosis, rhabdomyolysis, and secondary trauma. So the acidosis, how do we fix that? Fluids, rhabdomyolysis, how do we fix that? Stop the problem, don't make them, you know, calm them down so they stop pulling out their restraints and give them fluids. And secondary trauma, how do we do that? Sedate and restrain for their safety and your safety. So another thing is that we, we talk about dopamine, so that's your neurotransmitter in your brain. Now let's talk about catecholamine surge. So this is your adrenaline. This is your norepinephrine, your, your epinephrine and norepinephrine that's just surging out because the body is in such a state that it's obviously in a threat. There's something going on. You're in danger. And so what's happening is, is that this catecholamine surge is just launching. The floodgates are open. Well, just like we see in cardiac arrest where we can't get the blood pressure up or in sepsis where we can't get the blood pressure up. And I meant cardiac arrest after Rosk, of course. But what happens is, is that the body's stores of epinephrine and norepinephrine have depleted to such a point that, um, and then also your cortisol as well, that you are no longer able to squeeze out that life essential hormone and you will die. And so this is a reason why we need to be very, very, very conscientious of these patients and if you know they're they're starting to spiral, they go into cardiac arrest. That's a that's a little bookmark in your mind to say, hey, yeah, I mean they've they've essentially depleted all of their hormones. So maybe we should call medical control. Maybe you know maybe these are things that we need to be aware of to um, mitigate some of these problems. So what about the risks to you, me, our partners on the truck? Well, number one. It is very important to protect the agitated, combative patient from injuring themselves, cool, but to prevent injury to yourself. You, you can help thousands of patients in your career or not want you to get seriously maimed or injured or disabled because of a patient like this. So we need to be able to prepare with our partners in law enforcement and you know obviously we're a combined system here with fire and ems we're blessed to have our fire brothers and sisters on the scene but at the same time if you ever go to an agency that's not fire and ems where it's a volunteer fire department and literally you're the only one on scene you need to know how to prepare yourself for this so that being said what do we do well law enforcement officers must be there and whenever available should be involved in all of these cases. They have the weapons and we should not have the weapons. We're not going to use the bag. We're not going to use the tackle to tackle the, the you know, crazed, excited delirium patient. We're not going to manpower it through and, you know, put yourselves in jeopardy. There's a better situation. Now, obviously, if the patient is an immediate threat, then we need to take action if available. But if the patient is kind of like, you know, hair trigger away from getting nuts, then what we need to do is say, all right, let's get our law enforcement officers on scene. They have the mace, they have the taser, they have that. And if they need more manpower, we will be more than happy to assist them. So if you are in danger or your partner's in danger, you need to leave the scene, period. Leave the scene no ifs ands or buts and i've been in several situations where you know you just you just get that gut feeling that something's not right and the the patient is you know pacing i remember this one time this guy had a broken bottle and he said i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna kill everyone else you touch me i'm gonna kill you and i was like okay all right well um you know just call us if you need us and i got back in the ambulance we backed out we called for law enforcement you know, fortunately, he didn't kill himself, but that is perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You are not a police officer when you're on that ambulance. 
and it is not our job to subdue someone that has you know a potential for hurting yourself or any of your co-workers when the police department has underwent defensive tactics and appropriate takedowns for these p situations they are specifically trained and certified to do this so that in lies the the nuclear option here if there is no safe option for retreat and you or your partner is being physically attacked you may defend yourself as permitted by the law and there is nothing wrong with that but we want to avoid that uh, and that is the key safety is the key so let's watch another video real quick of a patient that might remind you of other patients that have you've brought over to the 40s over in LSU for a little bit it's okay. What is his name? Tim. 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 We need to go to the hospital. I'm going to go to the hospital. Ninety-one. We have to go to the hospital. Ten thirty-three. 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 Ten
Tim. 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 Relax. Relax. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yes, it is. Not okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It will be okay. You gotta calm down. Not okay. You gotta calm down. You gotta calm down. Don't We're going to the hospital. We're going to the hospital. This is gonna die. This is gonna die. No, 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 no. This is gonna die though. This is gonna die though. Remember, your mom's not worried about you. Try to relax. We can help you. Don't let him kill me! I love you, but this is gonna die though! This one! All the meat I've eaten, I forgive myself. This is gonna be him in it! Um, can I do a handcuff also loose in, in case... You're crushing Liar! You're liar! Alright. Liar! Liar! Liar, you're the one! Liar, you're the one! Let's get him out of here. Focus back with the shovel! Focus back with the shovel! Grab a shovel! We have a shovel in the backyard! Grab a shovel! Focus, 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 focus. All right, so that was a lot. And a couple things that we need to talk about in this is, is that, you know, if you, you were listening to the police officer, he said, hey, did you bring your meds? And they said, oh, yeah, we have some Haldol and I forgot the other med that they said. Um, you know, we don't use Haldol. Um, Haldol is a little dangerous. Uh, but they didn't give him anything. They just strapped him down. And meanwhile... He's doing all this weird breathing. He's fighting against the straps. He's moving his body. All of those micro movements are generating more lactate and generating the possibility that he's going to go into rhabdo. And, you know, he could have died in the ambulance. Um, so we, we need to be very aware that we all know how to identify excited delirium. And it's okay to give the ketamine, not to subdue the patient for law enforcement but to assist in calming the patient down to slow down the progression of their spiral of excited delirium. So we must never give medications to facilitate arrest or to assist law enforcement to take an individual into custody. This is a hot, bold, bright warning given by the governing body for EMS for the nation and we know this we're, we're not we're not the the candy men you know the sleepers that are like oh okay yeah we want to give him a little calm so he's calm and you know intake we don't do that but we if we're going to give them ketamine or versed or medications period then we're going to take them to the hospital they're they're our responsibility because that's a pretty big pretty big responsibility for non-medically trained police officers, or even those who are medically trained, but they're wearing a different hat to, um, to take over that. So what about restraining patients? So when you restrain patients, it's, it's important to realize that, you know, unless you want to be restrained, you don't want to be restrained. And you're going to fight against that restraint until you either are exhausted or you break something or you go to sleep and so you can imagine how with this patient that we saw he's on the stretcher he's fighting he's you know the police officer's like just calm down everything's okay well therapeutic communication is not going to work with a patient like this and these individuals are going to continue to fight and continue to struggle and to continue to resist and they're going to continue to worsen their metabolic acidosis and get hotter and hotter and hotter until they become so hyperthermic that either they seize out or they go into critical organ shutdown. So again, controlling the patient, calming them down is the first step to solving this problem. So let's talk about the cardiac arrest for a minute. So cardiac arrest and excited delirium is often, most of the time, but not always, preceded by a brief period of calm. A previously violent, agitated patient suddenly will become calm and lethargic. They'll be kind of like they're sleeping. Like, oh, they tired themselves out. Yeah, they did. And their organs are also tired. And your organs are kind of going to say, enough. So, for example, we saw in the first video with the African-American patient, you know, it said he got real calm and then he died. And you heard they're like, use two handcuffs and all this other stuff. And they were like, oh, he's fine. Well, 
for those of you who are in the know about you know the recent articles that have been coming out in the landmark trials and whatnot you know the george floyd um with the knee on the neck and all this other stuff not to say george had excited delirium but some said he did and they said well when he started getting calm it was because he was he was getting hypoxic well the same can be said about these individuals especially that first video that gentleman was you know laying on prone and they were they had multiple people around him so doing him while they safely secured him so he wouldn't hurt himself or any other person but we don't know what happened the video doesn't continue um but in one reality one could say that when you hold someone down enough and they're already so you know up and you know just crazed with this excited delirium um profile here that you've now taken away their final leg of life that last surge of catecholamine the body's like i've had enough and they just die so you have to make sure that you keep the patient in a position where they're able to breathe where they're able to be ex accessed by you and you know it's not a natural position for us to be face down period and you know we use proning positions for therapeutic stuff when it comes to intubated patients but they're intubated that's a very different story so these individuals need to be get got off their belly made supine as quickly as humanly possible so the management of agitation is the first and key primary issue um, to make sure that you solve their problem and it's very important because physical struggle is a significant contributor to this surge in metabolic acidosis that these patients have and so if you calm them down and stop them from moving so much and restraint is not stopping them from moving they have to be sedated to stop moving and you make sure that after you've gotten that safe zone there then the treatment is non-specific you manage your symptoms if they're hot you get their clothes off you put them in a cool environment if you think you know they've been diaphoretic and sweating and you know they've been sweating buckets give them fluid to dilute some of the acid in the rhabdo that's going to be forming eventually so you, you can do your good work by helping to manage those symptoms that will manifest out of the primary problem so this is a, a mnemonic that was generated by the paramedic journal um it's safety safety for the you know people anybody around them any type of threats that you have the safety of the paramedics and the safety of the patient um, safety officers is very important making sure that you're aware that if you have that spidey sense going on and the patient's just not not really working for you and you know it's like man this can turn bad real quick then you need to call for additional resources early and often making sure that if there is anything you can fix you focus on that while you've already maintained the safety of the patient and yourself and focusing on de-escalation strategies thou shalt not punch the patient i mean that's that's pretty standard um and you're not going to yell at the patient when you know the patient's really not hearing you they're not a child and you're not punishing them so they're going to not really respond well to that and if you get if you let it get under your skin like sometimes you know the inebriated individual can say some very hurtful and manipulative things that really try to push your buttons you just need to realize that these individuals you know they know not what they say you you have to be above it all and make sure that you focus on de-escalating it saying we're not going to talk like that and i'm just trying to help you and things like that um, evaluating getting a complete vital sign survey making sure their perfusion and status assessment you know obviously if they're they're altered the gcs isn't really a good perfusion but their vital signs would be making sure they're um, adequately breathing appropriately checking to make sure that they're moving all appendages remember stroke is an option too um, making sure that you are checking for any sample questions if you have that ability um, tactical communication make sure you listen to them you know the police officer in that second video did a really good job you know he was like we're not going to hurt you you know mom now he shouldn't have talked about her mom because that sent him off into space again but having empathy you know empathy is not saying i'm sorry it's saying yeah that's that sounds like it's really hard 
building that rapport and influencing in order to establish a positive behavioral change is very important with those patients because that can be the difference between a rough ride and an easier ride to the hospital. And yes, you have the right resources, law enforcement. If you're a BLS truck, you get ALS assistance or one of the supervisors to come on um, and getting those people in place so that you can have a great takedown with law enforcement and an even better subduing of that patient while you're treating them for their problems. So restraints. All right. So this is this is a this is something that I'm I'm really passionate about and how I was trained. And the reason why I say this thing on this slide is very important. And I'll give you a scenario. And if anyone has a as a good solution to this, you just let me know. OK, but I've yet to find anyone who's got a good solution to this. So rigid restraints such as handcuffs should not be used in the ambulance. The patient comes to you handcuffed from law enforcement and they say, hey, yeah, we're going to take them to the hospital. OK, cool. So when you're in the ambulance, you put them, you know, you sit them on the, the stretcher and you put soft restraints on their arms and you tie them to the, um, the bed rails, period. If you need to do four point, you do four point, whatever. You transition the soft restraints. And the reason for this is because if that ambulance flips, the oxygen catch is on fire, um, something happens that you have to do a quick egress, law enforcement handcuffs are not, there's nothing quick about a handcuff, okay? To put it on, maybe, if you're trained to do that. But to take them off, no. There's nothing quick about a handcuff. And just like in the hospital where we have rules that say the fire ties and the fire knots, in case there's a fire, if you have someone's restrained, you should be able to quickly pop that restraint off of the patient's bed to safely get them into a safe egress. You cannot do that with handcuffs. And with these patients, you must be able to safely get them because you are taking control of their safety because they are not safe by themselves. So we cannot keep patients in handcuffs. That is not a lawful thing to do because if something happens, then they're going to say, well, why was he chained to the bed? They don't do that in the hospital. Well, we have law enforcement with them. Okay, well, what happens if something happened? These are all questions that we need to ask ourselves. And it's not hard to transition someone from soft restraints to a uh, handcuff or, or vice versa, I should say. Literally, you just have them sit on the bed. And while their hands are behind their back, you attach the restraints to their, their arms while they're still in the handcuffs. And you have one person on each side. You have the law enforcement officer pop the handcuffs off while another person holds the arms. And you put them onto the bed, lay them securely and safely on there, and tie the restraints down. Done. Easy. So prohibited techniques. You will not hog tie them. Okay? Any technique that compromises the air, chest, or neck, do not transport the position uh, in the prone position or put a backboard on top of them and sandwich them and tie the backboard to the stretcher because they're too wild. And also, EMS practitioners must not use weapons as adjuncts. This isn't coming from me, folks. This is the National EMS White Papers. So this is, this is pretty, pretty big. This is above all of us. So how do we treat things? Well, verbal reassurance, calming them, establishing rapport, putting them on oxygen, all right? Put them on oxygen. To put them on a four lead, if, you, if they're calm enough, do a 12 lead just to rule out hyper-K because remember, you know, with rhabdo, the um, release of the, the potassium and all that stuff can cause electrolyte abnormalities that cause um, cardiac arrhythmias, getting their temperature, all right? Um, remember, mouth and axillary might be kind of hard uh, you might want to do a core temp on this this kind of patient because you know we we do have temperature gradients when it comes to extremes of temperature um, and you may not get an accurate temperature they could be 103 degrees you don't know how do we sedate them well for the left hand side this is moderate sedation um, there's Versed there's Ativan um, and then entitled CO2 anytime you use any type of sedatives and then for profound agitation we have ketamine. Um, we don't do the four mix per keg, but that is the upper, that's a threshold there. And if they have any type of emergent hallucinations, you can use Versed as that. Uh, you just need to call med control and whatnot. And if you need anything additional, you call med control. We're here to help. So let's talk about some of these medications for a minute. Versed, Ativan, ketamine. So the you'll notice that Ativan and Versed 
Um, they both are IM and IV and IO. Versed can be given IV, or excuse me, Versed can be given IN as well. Um, you'll notice that the time of onset for Ativan is four minutes versus 15 minutes for Versed. But on the comments over here, I want you to see Medazolam has the best pharmacokinetic profile for IM route versus Ativan that has got a poor pharmacokinetic profile. So if you have an IV established, give Ativan. If you haven't, um, I, if you don't have that, you need to give IM Ativan or Versed. You give them to them that way. Ketamine, great, great drug, perfect. Everyone loves ketamine. Um, now remember, there's been some litigation and some problems with ketamine where you have city council saying thou shalt not give ketamine. And some of those instances that it's been given is that the ketamine has been administered to assist in law enforcement. And that's the reason why that slide was put in here. It's very important that we do not contribute to that type of um, subduing. And that is not appropriate. And also, you know, if you give someone ketamine, you're obviously not telling them, okay, cool, yeah, treated release per protocol. Absolutely not. So um, with our ketamine here, you can give four to five milligrams per kilogram. It takes about three to five minutes to work and it lasts roughly under an hour and a half. And so um, it causes few hemodynamic changes, even in agitated patients. And um, it shows that people that receive the max, max dose, the ceiling of five mg per kg, less than one third of the patients actually needed to be resedated. And so um, you'll see here that as many as 40% of patients receiving ketamine ultimately required intubation because we put them so deep in the, the K-hole or what this doesn't say is is that those patients once they calm down enough that their catecholamine surge is over their cortisol surge is over they have nothing left to give and so they had to take over breathing for the patient because the patient just had nothing left in them so we need to make sure that with ketamine one thing that we really need to be aware of is this laryngospasm if you give someone ketamine and they stop breathing or they have striders respirations that's a laryngospasm you either breathe through it or you rsi them and so those are um that's that's kind of how you deal with that and make sure you got suction ready for the hypersalivation that could occur with this so neuromuscular agents that paralyze individuals are not acceptable for restraint i know that's common sense but you know if it's written that means it's happened before so reassessment after the patient's restrained physically and you've and or you've given them pharmacological management you're making sure you're monitoring them making sure you're assessing them the abcs every five minutes and making sure they're hemodynamically stable then you're going to make sure that you continue doing that abc and checking your bottle signs and uploading those Q5 minute bottle signs into your ESO report so that it demonstrates that you are doing the best job that you can as an excellent provider and making sure that, I mean, this isn't a medical emergency. This is serious and you're doing best by the patient. So special cases, right? Assessment and patient restrained by law enforcement. So at all times, you as the EMS provider must act as the advocate for the safety, medical monitoring, and clinical care of the patient. If you have a patient that says, I'm just drunk, and they were belligerent, and the officer's like, I'm just going to take them to the hospital. No, you should take them to the hospital, not the law enforcement. Why do I say that? Well, what happens if it's not alcohol? What happens if it's something else, and that patient has a in-custody death? Well, that, that, doesn't, that looks very poor for the police department, but also when you put in your report, patient was deemed stable for transport with law enforcement. You know, that's, that's putting your neck out there. You know, I'm not saying we need to be defensive, but I'll tell you this, I would much rather feel more comfortable with you as the EMS provider taking a patient who has the possibility of going south as a medical provider, you have all of the tools that you need to successfully resuscitate that patient in the back of your ambulance versus chained up in the back of a police vehicle where, you know, they might say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And the, the police officer is like, what are you talking about? You stop, you know, whatever. And so you, you need to be aware that as an EMS provider, you have the advocacy right for the patient that if you don't feel that the patient needs to, uh, that the patient is safe to go to the hospital with the law enforcement you should take them 
And if the police officer or the jail says, you know what, you don't know what you're talking about, that's when you when in doubt, punt it out. You call your supervisor. Because we need to be advocates for these patients and we need to be the, pay, the people that go on scene and say, whoa, 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 this may not be a false flag. This may be real. We need to be the strong, good, just voice in the chaos that says, we're here and we'll take care of it from here. Thank you for letting us know. So as a system, we also need to perform quality assurance on these patients. So every case of physical restraint, pharmacological management by anybody in EMS needs to have a review. That needs the call is reviewed by someone that is in a review role and we need to assess is the restraint appropriate? Was the type of restraint appropriate? How often were we monitoring that patient? Was our individual in-house protocols complied with? And did the, the person who was writing this report comply with the documentation standards that would pass the sniff test in court. So remember, every report that you write is subject to interpretation and you must be able to justify everything that you do. If you don't report it, it didn't happen. And if you're giving medication or you're restraining the patient and you didn't record that you restrained the patient and the patient says that they were held against their will, that's a problem. So it's always good as a system to go back and review these records to make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to protect the patient, the provider, the department, and the system. And so we have a responsibility from the top down and the bottom up to do everything we possibly can to do the best by the patient. So just an overview, patients with excited delirium are going to be extremely agitated, pose a significant risk both to everyone and themselves, okay? Um, and application of four point restraint reduces the development of rhabdomyolysis, or excuse me, rhabdomyolysis, only because they're not moving as much, but you still have the potential of serious rhabdo, even if you have not um, given them pharmacological management and you just tied them down. So I am an IN sedative agents with rapid onset talk about Versed, talk about Ativan, talk about ketamine, should be the first line pharmacology to get these patients into a safe spot, move them from the red zone to the caution yellow zone, and eventually with our treatment into the hospital down to the green. This is an excellent example where you as the first responder on scene has the potential to make life saving changes to this patient and elicit a positive outcome. We don't have many of those. We don't have many opportunities like call classes that we can really make a difference. You know, we talked about CPR, obviously that's a given. Strokes, obviously. We talked about sepsis, very important. And now this one, excited delirium, a really important opportunity for you to make significant positive changes to these patients and have a positive outcome. Well, thank you. That concludes the June 2022 Excited Delirium Continuing Education. Hope you learned some things from this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Remember, we do have the uh, CE questions that are attached to the Google form, and please submit those um, before next month, and we will get you some CE credits. I appreciate your time, and thank you so much.